Hey, what's going on? I'm Jason Park. I'm a feature filmmaker. I've made four feature films, and today I wanted to discuss with you guys, you know, something that, that no one ever really talks about, but it's like, how do you choose the right camera for you, right? And I'm going to talk about cameras and, and how I would break them down, right? Uh, and it doesn't matter if you want to make a feature film, if you want to make a short film, if you want to do a web series, a YouTube channel, music videos. It just, it just doesn't matter what you want to do. There's just a few questions you want to ask yourself because that will determine a lot. Number one, what's your budget, right? Can you afford the latest and greatest? Or do you have to do something that's more consumer budget friendly? For myself, I have to do something that's more consumer budget friendly. So when I was deciding cameras, it was really two main options that I had. Mind you, prior to this, I purchased the Red Komodo. And in the Red Komodo space, the competitors are you know, the Sony FX3, you go up a little bit higher, maybe the Sony FX6, you can get your Canon R5C, um, cameras of this nature. We're not really talking about, well, you could also get like the Ursa 12K for maybe like, you know, one to $2,000 more, but now you're talking about $6,000 for a camera. And I don't know about you, but that's used Honda Civic prices, right? Like these cameras are really expensive. And I personally, unless I'm on a, a like a, a really big shoot and there's a lot of money, I would never spend five thousand and above for a camera body because the returns are just not worth it. The majority of people are just not gonna see their notice or care about the difference. They're just not. So uh, when you go into that territory, right, the Ursa 12Ks, the Komodo X, the Sony FX6, FX9, like th that, that becomes such a distant thing uh, for the majority of us that unless you're rich, I would shy away from it because it's not necessarily going to make your work better. It may look incrementally better, but it's not going to make your work look better, right? That's the thing no one ever talks about. It's kind of like having a Honda Civic and a Ferrari, right? So let's say the Ari Alexa, you know, those cameras in that price range, anything, the Burano, anything above that 10,000 and, and, you know, just for the body, the, the Komodo Raptor or not the Komodo, the Red Raptor and stuff like that. You're talking about those are the supercars, the cameras, but... If making a movie, I just need to, I need to get to my destination, I need to be reliable, I need to good, get good MPG or battery consumption, I, I need these things, then the Honda Civic is going to do the job every single time. Now, it may not look as flashy or it may not look as good as the Ferrari or you may not get the oohs and the ahs, but you're going to get to that destination, maybe a little slower, but you'll get there every time. And that's kind of how it is with cameras, right? So if you're rich, you get whatever you want because you can afford to get whatever you want. And it doesn't even matter if it's to shoot for other people, to shoot a project for yourself, or just to shoot the dogs in the backyard because it's your money, you do what you want. But from a prosumer, consumer, you know, under that like $3,000 mark, for me, after I sold my red Komodo, because I realized I just like the image quality was phenomenal, but I just didn't like the workflow with the red Komodo. I am on the short list of people that I don't like box cameras. I don't want to rig it out. I just I don't. Right. When you have those FX3s, those Canon R5Cs and you got the monitor built in the C70s, I'm like, man, this is exactly what I want for me, because a lot of times you're going to run and gun solo dolo, wear multiple hats. Maybe you got your homie and then you're going to go make things happen. So for me, the two cameras that were on my list were, okay, let me go back to the Blackmagic uh, 6K full frame or the Lumix, right? It was the Lumix camera uh, by Panasonic. And I kept going back and forth on footage and footage and use case and use case. And I realized why the cinema camera 6K full frame was for me. 
It had that big display on the back. It had B raw and, and what why raw is so important for every new filmmaker, every new uh, video camera cinematographer out there. The reason why B raw is so important is because if you mess up your lighting on that day, right, you can go back in post and maybe lower your ISO or raise your ISO a little bit and and save yourself. Now, if it's excuse me, if it's just horrible lighting, you're not going to be able to fix it, but. If it's a little too high or a little too low, you can bring it up, right? Or bring it down. So that's why raw and that flexibility was so important to me. That monitor in the back was important to me. Uh, Built-in NDs, they're not important to me because I can just screw on an ND filter in 10 seconds. I, like, I just, I, I never saw the, the big appeal of, or, or the big deal about built-in NDs. Like I do not want to spend an extra $500 for a camera to have built-in NDs when I can screw one onto the lens and call it a day. Right. And then autofocus, autofocus wasn't something for me because when I buy a camera, I buy a camera to shoot movies and it's to only shoot movies. I'm not shooting client work. I don't care about shooting commercials. I'm not shooting music videos. I'm not shooting short films. I'm sh like my goal is to shoot feature films and that's it. Right. Like for me, I'm not out there looking for jobs. I'm not trying to be a wedding photographer or a videographer. I'm not looking to get hired by some, like I just I don't care about that stuff. I my concern and my focus is feature filmmaking. So the monitor, the B raw, I have my power solution, even though with this you run it for like 30 minutes and the battery's gone. But I have external batteries for that. Uh, gyro, I didn't care because I either shoot on a shoulder mount or a, a gimbal and that was it. It had what I wanted. The 13 stops of dynamic range. Is it cool to have 16, 17, 18? Yeah, that would be awesome. But guess what? If you're making a compelling story or you're shooting something that the audience likes, no one has ever, myself included, I've never watched a movie or anything and said, ah, look at the detail in the shadows. The only thing I've ever noticed is if the lighting, if the outside of like someone's house is blown out and you just can't see anything, it's just white. And then I'm like, oh, okay, I see that. But my wife doesn't see it. My daughters don't see it. No one else sees it outside of myself because I know, what's, I know what I'm looking at, right? So that kind of stuff is, is just e irrelevant to me. Global shutter versus, you know, uh, I forget what it's called on here, but like the standard shutter on the Black Magic. It's like that doesn't matter to me either because no one ever cares or ever says, oh, did you see when that camera was panning really fast? It was warping. No one. No one's ever said that. And I, I didn't even know about it or notice it until I learned about it, right? It's almost like, you know, ignorant is bliss, right? It's very true with anything because if you just don't know, you're just not paying attention to it. And, you know, quite frankly, the success of your project isn't determined by people in the industry. It's determined by the everyday people that watch and consume and enjoy your content, right? So for me, the black magic worked. It answered all those questions and it solved all that stuff for me. But if, it's, if you're on the fence and you're like, hey, I want autofocus, I want stabilization, I want low light, then you need to go look at the Sony FX3, right? You need to weigh your pros and cons when it comes to filming. You need to ask yourself, what are must-haves and what are not, what, like, I don't really care. So if your must-haves are, hey, I want built-in NDs, I want... Uh, stabilization and I want low light capabilities, then you need to go look at something else like the Sony FX6, right? So you have to really make that pro and con list of what you're doing to decide exactly what you want. Now, every camera nowadays is going to give you a nice picture. If you're in the boat of like, man, I can only afford one thing, right? Then get an iPhone 15 Pro because for Pro Max for 1300 bucks, you can go shoot some crazy gnarly stuff with that log profile on that phone, right? So you, you really have to determine what your budget is and what are the specs and attributes that you really, really want. For me, I don't do autofocus. I manually focus and pull everything because even if I slightly miss it and I get it in focus and it's smooth, it can work. Whereas if something is in autofocus and someone else comes in the frame and it jumps or it skips, I'm just like, ah, I can't use that. So those are really the two things that I would recommend that you ask yourself when picking a camera. Um, you know, everyone's going to give their opinion on what they think is best based on 
their comfortability and their experience with the camera. Now you have few channels out there uh, that use all the cameras and they can probably tell you what the best camera is in their opinion for the price brackets. Um, but it, it's, it's very important that you ask yourself what type of director, cinematographer, camera operator am I? Um, what do I wanna do? What am I okay with when it comes to shortcomings? Or you know, what accessories do I want? What's my total budget? Because operating a camera, buying a camera, lens, all that stuff, it gets pricey really fast. So when you see something like the GH series and it's like $2,000 and you get all these wonderful features in this package, you have to always remember that you're probably gonna spend another $2,000 on top of that on your battery solutions, your lens, your filters, your cage, your, if you want an external monitor, your cables, all that stuff. And the thing that no one ever talks about is like all the accessories within this space of operating cameras, even though it's gotten cheaper over time, is, it's way overpriced. Everything in this field is overpriced. I mean, this tilted cage that cost $120 for what, a little metal cage? Really? Like, like lenses. I mean, you're talking about lenses that have glass coating and some gears. Some lenses are worth more than cars and they're not worth more than cars because it didn't take more to build those lenses. I don't care what they are. I don't care if they're Cook. I don't, I don't care what the brand is. You can't tell me that more engineering went into that lens than the, the engineering and development that went into that Honda Civic, right? It's like everything in this field and in this space is overpriced. So you just have to be aware of that kind of stuff when you go into the space of like, whatever I'm spending on the camera, I'm probably gonna spend double, if not more, on the accessories to get that bad boy running. I mean, memory cards are a couple hundred bucks. Cages, a couple hundred bucks. Um, your gimbals, you want a good one with a heavy payload, you're gonna spend like $1,000. Your microphone set, you're gonna spend another $400. Your cage, 120 bucks. Your monitor, you want a good one, you want 4K or 10K, SDR, HDMI, you're gonna spend another 600 bucks. Like, it, it can get pricey, but I suggest rocking with the bare minimum that can make your job easier because all cameras are, are tools. And they're tools to help you get the job done. So I'm Jason Park with Hyper 2 Productions. I hope to see your next film or short film. Send it here. Keep creating, y'all. Don't wait.